So thank you for organizing uh, this, uh, this meeting. Uh, talk is a measurement of a helium tune out frequency as an independent test of QED. And uh, uh, the point is that uh, most atomic physics tests of QED have been just based on energy shifts, whereas this is a measurement of the QED correction to the frequency dependent polarizability, at least in uh, lowest order. Uh, it's a, a joint theoretical experimental collaboration. The exper experiment was done at the Australian National University in the group of Ken Baldwin, and actually it was Bryce Henson's PhD project uh, that uh, so this was uh, his, his, uh, his PhD work. And uh, let me go. Uh, so uh, the, the uh, outline of my talk, uh, first a motivation, a test of QED other than energy shifts. Uh, what is the tune out frequency? And then I'll talk uh, briefly about the uh, experiment itself, uh, which I, I borrowed some slides from uh, Bryce's uh, PhD talk for this. Uh, and, and so I'll attempt to summarize the experiment, not being an experimentalist. Uh, I may not be able to answer very many questions about it, but I, I at least communicate to you the, uh, the essence of what was done. And I'll talk in more detail about the theoretical form, form, formulation and especially retardation corrections. And I should mention that that on the, uh, the paper that was published, uh, Christoph is uh, acknowledged for his uh, uh, useful correspondence uh, about these uh, retardation corrections and then results and conclusions. So the, uh, the tune out frequency, as I said, it's a joint experimental theoretical collaboration. Um, the, uh, the, the theoretical part, uh, uh, Lian Tang and uh, Yonghui uh, Zhan at, uh, at the uh, Wuhan Institute of Physics and Mathematics uh, did a, a relativistic CI approach to this. Uh, ours is quite different, uh, NRQED type uh, calculation. And so it's mainly this latter part that I'll be discussing today. Uh, and it was just published just last month uh, in Science. Uh, so the basic definition, uh, uh, in lowest order is the frequency dependent polarizability, which has this form of sum over intermediate states, of dipole transition, uh, matrix element squared, and then these uh, frequency dependent uh, energy denominators. Um, so the present experiment is to measure the tune out frequency for the uh, 1s, 2s, triplet s metastable state of, of helium. Uh, higher order corrections to this lowest order contribution depends on the experimental conditions. And uh, so I'll talk about that in more detail. Uh, so there are two possible scenarios. First, an atom in an optical lattice. And this is the one that's been analyzed in greatest detail because of its connection with uh, frequency, high precision frequency measurements, time and frequency standards. Uh, here, the, the scenario is different. It's an atom in a freely propagating laser beam that scatters photons. Uh, and so this is a, uh, uh, gives rise to different kinds of retardation corrections uh, that I'll be discussing. Two principal publications, uh, both from 2019. And the uh, uh, first one is, is incomplete, but a complete analysis in this uh, paper by um, Christoph uh, Pekuski and Pokulski, also in 2019. Uh, and there's a motivation for this uh, uh, from a proposal to measure, you can regard it as a measurement of Avogadro's number uh, or an SI standard of pressure from the refractive index of the, for the ground state uh, of helium. And so this uh, provides a measurement of some of the same phenomenology uh, in the metastable state. And so it provides a check on the theory that goes into the uh, ground state measurement. Uh, and so these are some slides then from Bryce uh, Henson. Uh, we use this uh, notation for the slash. So it's a triplet S to the, between the uh, three triplet P and two triplet P. That, so it's in between these two that the, that the zero uh, occurs in the uh, frequency dependent polarizability. So here are the, uh, the two transitions from the triplet S to two triplet P at 1083 and, and this one at uh, uh, three, uh, whatever that number is, uh, 389. 
the zero is just below this at, a, at 413 nanometers uh, right in. Here is where the zero occurs in the tune out frequency. Uh, and I should mention that the, the idea that we should give credit to uh, Jim Mitroy, uh, who first suggested this experiment uh, back in 2013, along with uh, Lian Tang. Um, so the, the history of this goes back uh, almost uh, 10 years to the, this initial suggestion. Uh, so the polarizability, here's the, uh, the uh, di a dipole potential, depends on the uh, real part of the, this frequency dependent polarizability and the intensity uh, of the laser. And so, he, uh, and so we're looking for zeros in this quantity as a function of omega. Uh, and so the, uh, what happens is the, uh, you have these, uh, every time you hit a, a real resonance, you have an infinity. So it, uh, it, it goes off to, it crosses the uh, zeros, it starts off, uh, Okay, uh, it starts off here positive, goes to infinity, then comes back on this side, and then cross it. So this is the tune-out frequency here. Then uh, at, at the two triplet p transition, it's second infinity, then comes back, and there's another crossing here, and so on. So there's an infinite sequence of these crossings. We're looking for the first such crossing uh, between the two triplet p and three triplet p resonances. Uh, the Essence of the experiment is to take uh, a, a the, the triplet as state in a uh, uh, a, a Mott trap, uh, and the, and then with a probe beam to look for the the combined frequencies uh, of these two. So there's a, a a trap frequency and a probe frequency. They uh, they they add quadratically because after all the it's it's the square of the frequency that's proportional to the spring constant. Uh, and so if you add spring constants, uh, that's uh, equivalent to adding squares of the, uh, of the two frequencies. So we've got, it's a combined uh, uh, trap then with both uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the uh, magnetic trap and then the probe beam combined. And so what uh, the essence of the experiment then is to uh, tune the probe beam so that it, it, it makes no difference whether or not the probe beam is on or off. Uh, so the, 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 uh, the, the atoms are trapped in the M equals one substate. And then with an RF field, you uh, convert, it, convert it to the M equals zero, which, which is not trapped. So the atoms just fall out and are detected. And so that's the uh, means of detection. And, the, and you do this as a function of the probe beam frequency uh, in order to find the frequency where it doesn't matter whether the probe beam is on or off. So that's the basic idea of the uh, experiment. Um, so the uh, so what we're looking for then so the the uh, the probe is then uh, so the the signal is given then by the difference between the uh, the uh, the net frequency and the trap frequency, uh, and so that. Just that this is the quantity then that vanishes when the uh, frequency dependent polarizability vanishes as a function of frequency. Uh, this is a diagram of the apparatus, which I won't discuss in any uh, in detail. Again, this is from Bryce Henson's uh, talk, but here's the, uh, here's the, the mod where the, all the action occurs uh, and the, uh, the, the measurements are made. Uh, I will mention, though, the experimental error budget. The dominant source of uncertainty, uncertainty is the uh, is the birefringence of the uh, um, uh, with respect to the uh, the probe beam, uh, which and also the uh, the, the beam uh, beam anisotropy uh, method and the uh, method uh, linearity to give it a total. So here's the total tune out frequency in uh, in megahertz. 725, 736, 700, plus or minus 260. Uh, so let's move on now to the, uh, the theoretical part of the, uh, of the talk. Uh, so we start with the non-relativistic Schrodinger equation and include the poly form of the bright interaction by perturbation theory. Uh, the basic expression for the 
dynamic polarizability is of second order in the interaction. Uh, and so any additional contributions are then included by means of uh, an additional perturbation. Uh, and so we can, uh, just to uh, make the notation more compact, we can uh, define the resolvent operator. Uh, and so then the, the, uh, the dipole polarizability is then, you can write it then as this product of the dipole moment, uh, the resolvent operator dipole moment. Uh, so this then corresponds to a sum over intermediate states. If you add any additional perturbation, any one of these uh, uh, um, contributions from the, uh, the uh, bright interaction, you then have double sums over intermediate states. And so this, is the, this represents the change in the polarizability due to these additional uh, uh, contributions from the uh, bright interaction. Uh, so the tune-out frequency then corresponds uh, for S states. There's a, an electric field part. Here's the uh, polarizability sum over all the, uh, these perturbations. This is a, a correction due to the uh, beta logarithm, a QED correction, and these are retardation corrections. So I'll talk about each of these uh, 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 shortly. Uh, and then here's the uh, magnetic field part, magnetic susceptibility, and also a retardation correction to the magnetic susceptibility. Uh, and so what we're looking for, we want to then vary the frequency such that the sum of all these terms sums to zero. So that's the theoretical uh, formulation of the problem. So we're looking for zeros in this expression. <clears throat> uh, the relativistic corrections consist of, the, these are the standard terms from the bright interaction. Um, uh, we also include the, in the spin-spin interaction term, there's a, an anomalous magnetic moment correction. And it's interesting that the spin orbit and spin other orbit terms that are normally part of the bright interaction, in fact, sum to zero uh, when summed over the uh, intermediate, uh, uh, fine structure splittings of the uh, intermediate uh, triplet P states, uh, at least if, if, to the extent, if you regard, if you neglect the, the splitting of these states, uh, there'd then be a, a higher order correction to this uh, from if you take into account the uh, the fine structure splittings, but if you just sum, if you regard these as degenerate and sum over them, then the these the spin orbit and spin other orbit terms don't contribute. But there is a contribution from the uh, spin spin interaction that uh, that produces an anisotropy uh, in the the uh, uh, frequency dependent polarizability. Uh, leading QED corrections. These are the uh, standard terms that enter into the energy shift, uh, but we're now treating them as, uh, as, as second order perturbations. Uh, so they're included as one of the terms in the sum over intermediate states along with the, uh, the, the uh, bright interaction. <clears throat> and, uh, and finally, I won't go through all of this in, in detail, but I did want to at least put it down in writing on the slides. The, the, uh, uh, correction due to the electric field dependence of the beta logarithm. Uh, and the basic argument is that the beta logarithm is determined almost entirely by the uh, inner 1s electron. Uh, it's uh, to 1% accuracy, it's independent of the, what, uh, whether or not there's an other electron, uh, what state it's in, or, uh, or, or even the state of ionization. If you remove it all together, you still have uh, almost the same beta logarithm. Uh, and so uh, we, we took a, a, the calculated value from, um, uh, from, from, this, uh, from the uh, Pekulski paper for the ground state and said that the, for, the, for the metastable state, it's the same number to 1% accuracy. And so that's the, uh, the uh, argument on which this is based. Uh, there's also a magnetic susceptibility term. Uh, <clears throat> that uh, we calculated, uh, that gives a, a correction of 188 megahertz. So remember the experimental uncertainty is about 260 megahertz. So this is significant uh, in terms of the comparison with experiment. Uh, and finally, uh, retardation corrections. Uh, and here we uh, took the results directly from the uh, Pekuski and Pekulski paper. Uh, for these, these uh, generalized polarizabilities, 
first alpha zero, this is the ordinary uh, dipole polarizability. This is the a quadrupole polarizability term. This is a finite wavelength correction. Uh, and this is a, uh, a relativistic correction to the dipole transition operator itself. And this is a, a magnetic term, but in, in fact, this cancels out uh, when, when you calculate the, the total. There, so there's a, a, a retardation correction to both the polarizability and the magnetic susceptibility with the alpha to the four terms here. You have plus and here minus, so these, these cancel. Total retardation correction is quite large, minus 476 megahertz. And again, remember the experimental accuracy is 260. So this is uh, an important correction. Uh, and again, uh, the correspondence with uh, Christoph was very useful in, uh, uh, in this part of the calculation. I should mention though, that there's a difference of, of, of a factor of uh, two thirds from their, their definitions. And uh, so uh, uh, if you remove these, then the, uh, these definitions correspond to the standard definitions in the literature for these uh, polarizabilities. Uh, and there are also two QED corrections to the dipole transition operator and anomalous magnetic moment term, which again can, uh, vanishes if you're in summing over the fine structure splittings, it's just like the spin orbit interaction. And then uh, vertex corrections, which uh, also you can show uh, uh, are zero uh, in, for the case of coherent uh, Rayleigh scattering. And also uh, this term uh, is zero because it's proportional, it has the same frequency dependence, so it vanishes at the same place as the, uh, the non-relativistic term does. Uh, so uh, calculations, our method of calculation is to if we expand again the resolvent operator, then we come back to our uh, more familiar looking expression for the, uh, the frequency dependent polarizability. We do the sums over states by, uh, by a pseudo state expansion method. Uh, we use wave functions in our uh, double basis set representation. So we have two sets of nonlinear parameters. Uh, and this provides an important additional degree of flex flexibility in the wave function. These are Hilarus coordinates, powers of R1, R2, and R12, which is the electron-electron uh, separation. Uh, and all calculations were done using standard quadruple precision uh, arithmetic, which is about 32 decimal digits. Uh, an important advantage of this method is its numerical stability. Uh, it's not necessary to use extended precision or, uh, arithmetic beyond the standard quadruple precision. Uh, so here's a summary of the various theoretical contributions, beginning with the non-relativistic uh, value, this is dominant contribution, and then non-relativistic plus the scalar part, this, uh, the tensor part, this is the part that comes from the spin-spin interaction uh, term in the bright, uh, bright interaction that contributes this uh, tensor component to the, to the polarizability. So here's the total non-QED part and then the QED corrections, order alpha cube, alpha to the four to give a total QED part. Here's the, this is the retardation term uh, from these uh, uh, generalized polarizabilities. The magnetic polarizability, nuclear size to give a, this grand total in comparison with the experiment, leaving a difference of a little uncomfortably large of minus 459 megahertz plus or minus uh, 260. So it's, but it's less than a two standard deviation difference, but still uh, uncomfortably large. So it's uh, necessary, I think, to do further work on this on both the experimental and the theoretical side, uh, because after all, the, this retardation correction is, 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 is at minus 477 and the difference is 459. So uh, one wonders whether there might be something that uh, requires further work here. Uh, this just shows a graphical representation of these various contributions. Uh, just, just, this, these are the, just the size of the error bar. Uh, and this is a logarithmic uh, scale, uh, 10, 10 to the one, two, three, four, and so on. And then same thing on the other side. And this just shows the sizes of these various contributions. And here's the, compared with the theory minus experiment. Uh, so these are not error bars. These are just showing the size of the various contributions 
uh, all, of course, set here's zero going right down uh, the middle. So it's the size of these terms relative to, uh, to zero. And uh, so uh, in, in summary then, uh, our final theoretical result differs from experiment by about 1.7 uh, standard deviations. Uh, it's the first atomic physics test of QED of an atomic property other than the energy. And so this, I think, gives it a, additional uh, significance um, in terms of, uh, of testing QED theory. Uh, it's the first test of retardation corrections within this photon scattering picture instead of the dynamic uh, polarizability it, uh, for an atom in an optical lattice. Uh, the connection with the refractive index provides an SI definition uh, for, for pressure. Things still to be done uh, to calculate the electric field correction to the beta logarithm. So we, we just made the assumption that it's the same as for the ground state to within 1% uh, accuracy. That needs to be checked. Uh, the non radiative corrections of order alpha to the four, this is the dominant source of uncertainty. And so this, this needs to be uh, done. But it's at the six megahertz level. Uh, so it's relatively small compared to the, uh, the uh, uh, other theoretical contributions. And also to continue, continue improvements of the re relativistic CI method by the uh, Wuhan group. Uh, their work provided an important independent check of all of these calculations uh, it, 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 to show that, to, uh, that we haven't missed a factor of two or got a sign wrong or something like that. Uh, it provided an important uh, way of, uh, of checking our results. And so I'll, uh, I'll stop there and uh, uh, answer any questions, at least on the theoretical part, maybe not so much on the experiment. You can still try the experiment. Too. Thank you, Roland. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's a time for uh, questions. Bim Obat. Mm -hmm. um, thanks, Roland, for a very nice uh, talk. Um, I'm not so familiar with the, with the phenomenon. Uh, so you measure uh, the point where the Rayleigh scattering becomes zero. Right. That's, that's the thing. Uh, and you say it's other than the energy, but you do determine an energy. Eh? That's, uh, well, uh, the at, frequency at of the yeah, yeah, but it but the but it's uh, it, the frequency dependent polarizability itself comes from a sum over all intermediate states, not just one state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's the off diagonal QED correction yeah. that's being tested, as opposed to the diagonal. Yeah, that, that that is actually my second question because I mean you now have a test of QED on the accuracy of 250 megahertz, uh, while the real energy levels you measure to sub megahertz, and you also test. And uh, so, is this then a stringent test, or is it not, uh, in, in respect to the other uh, test on the, on the real energy levels? Well, uh, it's uh, it's not as sensitive to alpha to the four corrections, for example, as a direct energy measurement, but it's a new kind of test that hasn't been done before. So that that's the thing. It's not. I mean, it can, there's still room for improvement on both the theory and the experimental side. This is the first cut at a new method of measuring uh, or testing QED. Next question, moment, because Thomas will speak on it. So we might, I think we need a diversity of tests. That's very important. If we only exclusively do the most accurate ones, we are missing a lot of, a lot of possibilities. So it's not, it's not the main question, which, what is the most accurate one? <laughs> okay. uh, this uh, one percent uh, correction of <coughs> frequency independent uh, of uh, electric field dependence of better algorithm is for the static polarizabilities. I have uh, two questions. First, how this translate into the contribution to the tune out, tune out frequency? This one percent. If you add one percent to the to the beta logarithm, what kind of a contribution would this result to the tune up frequency? Oh, one, uh, one question. Another question is about the um, possible frequency dependence of this beta logarithm. How is it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, the, the, the contribution is less than one megahertz. The one, the, the, it's less than a megahertz. So it, it's small compared to the 260 megahertz. Uh, 
uh, as far as the frequency dependence is concerned, the frequency where the two note occurs is, is very small compared to the one S excitation energy. So it's a, it's a small fraction of the, uh, of the uh, amount of energy it requires to excite that uh, inner 1s electron. So it should, it's essentially the zero frequency limit with respect to the important excitations that determine the beta logarithm. Yeah, thanks for this uh, nice talk about this, this great uh, new method. I, I would like to rephrase maybe Wim's question. Is there something, suppose you measure some arbitrary atom with uh, very great precision, is there something orthogonal in your, in your calculation uh, um, that you can test some other QED contributions which do not show up in normal energy level measurements? Uh, it's basically the same, the, uh, the same terms, just taken as off-diagonal uh, corrections. But I should uh, bring attention back to these retardation corrections that haven't been tested before. Uh, and in fact, they're, they're different from the, uh, the case of an, an atom in an optical lattice. So, I mean, this is the part that depends on the experimental conditions. And it's these retardation correct. And, you know, if you're going to uh, do a measurement uh, for a refractive index for, for ground state of helium as, a, a, as an SI standard of frequency uh, of pressure, then, then you need uh, to know whether or not these uh, retardation corrections are, uh, are right or not. And uh, um, so I at, at, because these are completely effect, effects which has been neglected so far. Right. Usually when you include uh, parasitivity, you never include magnetic uh, parasitivity, but the okay. government has to include also magnetic parasitivity. So I would say it's a different looking on similar things, but the, from the different angle. Then you know, take, take, have taken on some effects which you, which you will never, which you never think that they contribute. This, because they got, they haven't included originally this, this, this scattering, this uh, retardation correction. But only recently, he was, he was checking carefully the papers and found out that it may contribute. So it's very important. But I have to comment to this RCI. RCI will never compete with the, with the accuracy of this NRQD approach, because with RCI, it's a, it's, it's a method which you believe it is correct, but it's far from having. Uh, good mathematical grounds. It is not mm -hmm. well grounded uh, method. Yeah, calculate I, something, yeah, I, but you don't know what you really calculate. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, uh, yeah. The the uncertainty is not. Uh, it, I know. There's no systematic way of improving it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> different people may have a different point of view. I right. express mine. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's Please. still it's still useful as a method of, of having a cross check with the NRQED uh, results. It's it's the, the it's the, the main contribution that uh, is difficult to get as accurate. So if you say it is a good cross check of an RQ, of an RQD method, then I would say with RCI you cannot calculate any QE. So, <laughs> so anyway, for the questions. If not, let us thank Gordon once again. Mm -hmm.